Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cryptid Clues. I'm your host, Ruben Olson. Today, we're going to start cracking open the vault of evidence for the big man with the big feet. Before we dive in, be sure to check us out at cryptidclues.ca and send us an email at cryptidclues at gmail.com. Join our Patreon for as low as $1 for ad-free, exclusive content and rewards at patreon.com slash cryptidclues. And finally, you can find us on almost all social media. If you're listening to today's show, you might be wondering just exactly what consists of evidence for Bigfoot. Whether you're a skeptic or already a believer, let's go on a small journey together and see what's out there. I'll list off everything categorically and describe it for those of you who like hearing my voice or hate it enough to fuel your desire to punch me in the throat. Finally, once this is all over, it's up to you to believe in the possibility of the big man or the possibility of a big hoax. Today, we're going to be exploring the first two of four categories of what I consider to be evidence. Historical evidence physical evidence, video evidence, and audio evidence. When it comes to sorting the wheat from the chaff, I'd like to provide us with a baseline for what qualifies as evidence, specifically more so for the physical and beyond that could be faked using modern techniques or technology. Physical evidence, for instance, is pretty hard to fake. We live in a world where we can test for DNA bear hair samples to known species, and we can put out footprints through vigorous tests to see whether or not they could have been wooden planks or made by real fleshy feet. While there are a plethora of footprint casts, we can toss out all those wooden plank pranks, which is very fun to say, wooden plank pranks. Uh, carrying on, video evidence is something of a double-edged sword in the Bigfoot realm. Newer videos can just be debunked almost too easily by claiming that CGI is responsible for superimposing a hairy man in the woods. Older videos, on the flip side, can be valuable because they lack the CGI trick, but are often blurry and not very detailed, making it hard to pick out what is or is not a costume, or a Wookiee out looking for a cookie. I'll never say it like that again. Audio evidence is perhaps one of my favorite things to look into. We can analyze sound waves on a computer screen, pick out the things outside the realm of human possibility, and if a file isn't edited and contains a yell with frequencies outside our range of hearing, there's a good chance it's something worth picking out and analyzing, and seeing if it matches anything we've heard before. So with that out of the way, let's start compiling a list of our holy grail of evidence. When it comes to historical evidence for Bigfoot, what's the first thing that comes to mind? For me personally, I grew up thinking that the 1967 Patterson-Gimlin film was the start of it all. The classic Bigfoot video where a couple of cowboys see big ol' Patty walking from left to right, stopping partway to turn and say cheese for the camera. While this video would kickstart the Bigfoot trend... This isn't where it all began. This was merely where the pop culture set its roots. To make this interesting, we're going to go back until we hit the wall with historical documentation, and what better way to begin than with the entire continent of America? I mean, after all, Christopher Columbus discovered the American continent in 1492, and he claimed the land that we've so heavily corrupted. However, we can go back beyond that, Tales of others crossing the ocean before then have since arisen. Leif Erikson, an Icelandic explorer, established a settlement in Vinland, which later became the country we know today as Canada. 
Tales of his arrival date back to 986 AD, according to the sagas left behind by his people. To confirm this, the Inuit people also describe encounters with these Norse settlers. Leif wrote about his encounters during his expedition, but one little detail seems to describe something non-human. Horrible, ugly, hairy, swarthy, and with great black eyes is the description he gave to his discovery of the Skellering, a Norse word of contempt for barbarian. Now, coming from a people known for burly builds and hefty beards, surely to call something big and hairy would be required to be larger than they were. Finally, he ends his encounters of the Skellering with this. Huge hairy men towered over my men and me. The beast lived in the woods and had a rank odor and a deafening shriek. I feel like I'm not going out of my bounds here to say that he's almost perfectly described a Bigfoot. Now this is just the account of a settler in 986 AD. He may have been a little frightened writing in his journal for all we know, but what about tales from the people who were in America first? There's too much to list here, but nearly every Native American tribe on the continent has some description of a Sasquatch. The Salish word, Sasquets, which might sound familiar to those of you who prefer the term Sasquatch, means wild man. To the Salish, Sasquets are supernatural, giant, hairy beings who live in the woods. And in another tribe, the Ojibwe, they have the Sabe, which are the same giant and hairy entities. But to them, it represents one of the seven teachings. These teachings from the Ojibwe are wisdom, love, respect, bravery, honesty, humility, and truth. While each teaching is represented by a natural animal, our big friend Bigfoot stands for honesty because he knows who he is in life and how to walk in a good way. An honest person is said to walk tall like the Kichi Sabe. He does not seek the power, speed, or beauty of others. Be honest with yourself, recognize, and accept who you are. I think a good final note here on the native legend of Bigfoot is to mention that these names and descriptions of hairy wild men aren't native to the American continent either. This thing is global. Tribes separated from each other by entire oceans share this common entity in Bigfoot. So if Leif Erikson wrote about the Sasquatch in 986 AD, what about people from his side of the globe? This is where Bigfoot legend kind of gets murky, unless you know where to look. Just like the Native Americans have their own unique names for Bigfoot, there's actually a rather dull name I've already brought up that was used frequently in the stories of castles and knights. Medieval European history is ripe with tales of wild men. Not much of a term, though. But they're not humans living in the wild. Though that was sometimes the assumption, wild men in European medieval history were again tall, hairy, beast-like men out in the woods. There are countless tales of them, and they're actually prevalent in historical art. Statues and pottery even depict these hairy giants fighting wars over moats with knights and horses. Taylor and I actually did a deep dive into the medieval wild man in episode 10 of Cryptid Clues. If you want to dive into Excalibur and Caliber and Tear legend, check it out. I couldn't believe there was so much representation of something that looks like a Bigfoot hidden in my favorite history lessons and Arthurian myths. So, where can we go beyond this? We don't have a lot of history beyond castles and knights, right? Well, history gets a little muddy as we crawl back toward the Roman Empire. If we traverse into the fall of Rome, we approach the estimated date of Painted Rock. Now, this is a rock shelter back in America associated with a prehistoric village in California. Located adjacent to the Tule River, this cave has paintings on the walls in red, yellow, and white depicting various wildlife like coyotes, beavers, frogs, eagles, and a trio of weeping big hairy monsters. Descendants of the Painted Rock Village tribe, Ochingita, simply claim that these depictions of giant hairy beings are one and the same with local Bigfoot legend. As for the estimated date these were painted, possibilities go all the way back to 1 AD 
and that's a that's a long time ago. This now puts us back into biblical times, a time ripe with development of many well-known mythologies, monsters, and legends where gods and monsters were accepted as simple fact, and multiracial beings like centaurs, satyrs, and mermaids wouldn't be doubted by people if you told them a story, or if you told them that it's about time for an ad break. Welcome back, everybody. So, what evidence do we have before we truly enter prehistory and traverse all the way back to the beginning? The Epic of Gilgamesh is an epic poem from ancient Mesopotamia, regarded as the earliest surviving notable literature and the second oldest religious text. In it, Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, is accompanied by his wartime comrade and bestest buddy Enkidu. Enkidu is a wild man, the embodiment of the uncivilized being, equaling Gilgamesh in strength, but not necessarily in wit. While depictions of Enkidu are slim, he is often described or pictured as a bull man, a lion, or, you guessed it, a large, hairy, giant-like creature. To go back before this is to argue theories on the essence of what Bigfoot really is, and then we kind of stop discussing history altogether. Theories such as Bigfoot being a remaining form of Nephilim, an alien being, a living Neanderthal, or some mixture of all the above, we're not here for the mental Sasquatch soup. So, to recap our history segment, we've gone back before the Patterson-Gimlin film, beyond Christopher Columbus, past Norse settlement, through native fact and legend, past the wielding of Excalibur, and even before Christ. With all of this history, we've basically set ourselves a nice spot on the table for dinner, but our plates are still fairly empty. Where's the food? Let's take a look at some physical evidence to put on our plate. How about a scalp and a hand? Well, before I dive into that, actually, I'd like to note that as far as DNA testing and examining physical evidence is concerned, it's important to note that we can only proclaim results based on comparisons. Many people think if we found Sasquatch DNA, scientists would just say, oh, well, this is new DNA unknown to science, therefore Sasquatch is real. However, that's not the case. We examine the DNA in hair samples by comparing it to things we know, and whatever that sample is most like, we say it is either that thing, very close to it, or is something unknown and not valid, unless we get other samples. Let's say we collect hair from a Bigfoot, hair from a human, and hair from a hoax that used some goat hair. If we examine the hair, we can put it under a microscope and look at the cuticle, cortex, and medulla. In human hair, we'll see a long and transparent cylinder with a dark center tube called the medulla. If we examine this and compare it to the other human hair, well, it'll pretty much look the same. If we look at the goat hair and that transparent tube, it might be thinner, and the medulla in the center makes up almost the entire thickness of the strand. So now, if we look at Bigfoot hair, and it looks the same as human hair or the same as goat hair, what will science claim we found? If we don't have a live or a dead Bigfoot known to science to compare it to, this sample of hair is both extremely important and entirely useless. If we keep collecting hair samples and couple it with large footprints and other evidence, we can make a database to compare hair samples to and then say, hey, this is most likely a Bigfoot. At least, until we have a living or dead Bigfoot to compare it to. Well, what if we look at the DNA evidence? Again, we play a game of comparisons. There is no Bigfoot DNA in the database to compare a sample to. But just like humans share 99% of their DNA with chimpanzees, maybe we can identify potential Bigfoot DNA as being a percent similar to something. Sadly, if the samples are degraded, we may not be able to get that far as that would leave it similar to too many things. After all, humans also share 98.5% of their DNA with dolphins. Ugh. So really, the DNA game is a difficult one. We'll either end up with a sample that is unknown, or a sample 
that is either contaminated or false. A contaminated sample, by the way, is like trying to spit into the communal spittoon and then separate the original spit back out of it. If I was to touch a piece of Bigfoot evidence with my bare hands, I'm getting my 100% conclusive human DNA on it. Now, I'm not mixing my DNA with something. I'm not creating a new sample. But think about how small a strand of DNA is. I'm creating a needle in a haystack, and when I go to extract that strand, it could turn out to be mine later on. Now, that was a lot of prelude, but I think we're ready to examine that scalp in hand and slap it down on the dinner plate. According to members of the Pangbosh Monastery, a monk once walked into a cave to meditate, where he saw a yeti. Many years later, the monk came back to find that the yeti was dead. He collected the hand and scalp and took it back to the monastery, where it remained until it was discovered in the modern age. There's actually a lot of drama around these items. Parts of, and eventually the entire hand, was stolen, smuggled, replicated, and possessed by individuals with intentions unknown. I personally question if we ever really truly obtained samples from the original hand, but let's take a look at some of these samples and studies and find out. So in 1960, findings initially concluded the hand to be hominid in nature, but was later found to be a closer match with a Neanderthal. Then, in 1991, unsolved mysteries obtained samples and determined they were similar to human tissue, but were not human, only near human. The hand was stolen after this. So, in 2010, a workshop produced a replica skull and hand to give to the monastery for display, to make up for the stolen hand, and keep the original scalp tucked away safely. In 2011, samples of the hand still existed, and it was concluded to contain a very strong match to human DNA. So, what about the scalp? Back to 1960, initial examination concluded that it was unknown, but closely matched Himalayan goat hair, and wasn't actually from a scalp. Reports were that it was debunked. Then, in 2019, Josh Gates investigated the scalp, and scientists concluded, in a DNA test, that the hair contained an unknown DNA sequence. So, is it debunked, or is it not? I suppose, with all the drama surrounding this mystery, we should tiptoe away from the convoluted stuff, and get into something simpler, like footprints. When it comes to Sasquatch tracks, there's an important lesson about hoaxing over in Survivor Man. Lestroud made several episodes on the hunt for Bigfoot, after he had a few incidents he couldn't explain. During one of these episodes, we get a rather nice summary of how hard it actually is to fake footprints. It sounds easy enough to put on some wooden shoes and go slap-slap down on the mud or snow, but there's something about Bigfoot's big feet that actually make it rather difficult to fake. First of all, it is incredibly easy for a scientist to debunk a footprint. If you collect a set of prints, and every single impression of the left foot and the right foot is the same as the previous left foot and the previous right foot, it'd start to turn into a dead giveaway that somebody's wearing fancy prank shoes because there's not a lot of flexing and variation going on here. Not only that, but we have to take into consideration that a Bigfoot is a big boy, and he takes big steps. Hoaxed footprints are commonly within human reach, one after another, almost repeatedly, since a larger shoe means less space between steps. And as humans, we aren't very heavy, so making a deep impression in anything other than snow is almost impossible if you want to hoax a set of tracks. What does a set of real Bigfoot tracks look like? Well, obviously big, but that's aside, there's something untouchable about them. Their stride. Bigfoot tracks are several feet apart. Unless a hoaxer wants to do the splits every step, this makes a trail of footprints hard to fake. Not only that, but Bigfoot tracks are found in a peculiar pattern. They appear to walk as if they're on a tightrope. Left prints and right prints aren't alternating side by side, but rather one straight ahead, perfectly in line with the last, a couple meters back. Not only that, but tracks are deep. 
Researchers stomping up and down can barely make a deep impression like the footprints they're casting. So now what about stilts? Honestly, you could get the stride length, but imagine the difficulty. And on top of that, if you stumble once and ruin the ground you're hoaxing, it's game over. So there's lots of good Bigfoot tracks. Perhaps the most impressive is a collection owned by Jeff Muldrum, a professor of anthropology and anatomy. One of the biggest things to look for in a Bigfoot cast is whether or not there's evidence of a mid-tarsal break, something humans do not possess and could not be demonstrated by a mere wooden plank. A mid-tarsal break is a bendable area of the foot that is able to elevate the heel while stepping down and apply pressure closer to the front of the foot when the front of that foot slaps down. Whereas we as people walk and hit the ground with our heels first. Many of Jeff's casts demonstrate this along with skin pads, moving or spreading toes, and clear signs of something alive having made these impressions. And only something that exists can leave behind evidence, whether it be a Bigfoot or a hoaxer. So, with a few items of physical evidence selected, we've boiled Bigfoot down to something tangible. If it does indeed exist, it would appear that history accounts for it, and something is out there leaving physical evidence behind. Where do we go from there? Well, without a body, we'll never prove it. What better way to gather evidence than to, I don't know, record it? After all, all it takes is for simply one piece of history to be accurate, or one piece of evidence to be real. That would mean that there are Sasquatch out there. So, join me next time for part two of this episode, where I'll list and describe my favorite video and audio evidence for Bigfoot, and talk about why they're so important and relevant today. If you liked or didn't like what you heard, come check us out on the website at cryptidclues.ca, maybe help us out over on Patreon at patreon.com slash cryptidclues, send us a message Cat, stop meowing. I'm trying to do my outro. Send us a message on our email at cryptidclues at gmail.com or on any of our social media accounts. Until next time, bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>